Hey everyone, happy new year. And as it's the first video of the year, I thought I would do an updated studio tour. For those of you that don't know, I moved house within the last year, so it's gonna be a completely different room. I'll link to the old video in the description below. But in the meantime, follow me and I'll show you what's going on upstairs. All right guys, welcome to my studio. Um, it's gonna go through with what I've got in here. I know a lot of you guys are interested. So, got obviously my desk here. There's a rack over here. An amp rack over here. Storage unit, my guitars, box of doom. There's some other little bits and pieces here and there as well. Um, <clears throat> the desk and the rack are made by a company called Zayor Furniture. I also have they, their um, isolation planes for my speakers. Um, I bought all of this, I bought the desk, bought the rack unit and I bought the ISO planes and they've all been great. I can't really fault the company at all. The construction's really good, it's held up pretty well. It looks pretty, so it's pretty much everything you want from a piece of furniture. Um, I bought this while about two years ago. It was in my old studio room as well and since moving to this new place, obviously there's a lot more space in this room. Um, so it seems a lot less intimidating now this desk being that it's like 2.3 meters wide or something like that anyway so we'll start with the left hand side of the rack as there's not too much in it so i have this yamaha p2500 power amplifier and that is what is powering my ns10s which are i would consider the most used monitors that i have I've been using the ns10s now for two to three years and they took quite bit of time to get used to but what really made them excel is when I got the Sonarworks reference and it just fixed all the problems that I was having with them so now I understand why so many engineers like them I can imagine that back in the 70s and 80s when so much money and time was spent on acoustic treatment in studios that these speakers just if you can make them sound good on this then they're gonna sound pretty great on everything um, they're actually not horrendous to listen to anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, I have three blanking panels here, uh, just because I've got nothing to fill the space for the time being. I actually do have a lot more rack gear, but um, I don't want any of my guitar sound rack gear in this unit. I want to save this for like stuff like preamps, sound cards and stuff like that, just so that it's all at my fingertips. Um, and if we move to the center of my desk, to the left hand side I have um, Something that I'm going to explain later, but it's the remote for my Ampeat amp and cab switcher. So basically, if I want to go into my box of doom, um, let's do, um, you know, I can select whatever I want. You can have two cabs at once, one amp. Um, it just all affects on the amp on the switcher there. It's a very, very useful piece of kit. It's basically a matrix so you can create something like a physical modeler so you can cascade these systems but I'm going to talk about it more let's just talk about what's going on, on this desk so I've got a spare lens for my Lumix just there I was using it earlier in the center here I have um, a Behringer monitor controller the Zenex control one USB um, I can't fault that either to be honest I mean it works um, it started getting a little bit crackly I mean I've had it for three or four years at this point maybe even longer maybe five years so it's held up very well considering it was what just over a hundred English pounds it's done very very well um, I have a USB hub here so I can connect like my phone uh, webcams my um, mouse and keyboard um, I've got my controller plugs in there so I can play Rocket League <laughs> um, I've got the Corsair gaming keyboard and mouse because most of the time I used to play games with keyboards and keyboard and mouse because it was like shoe em ups and stuff and I always you know learned to play that way um, but I recently got a controller for Rocket League. I got a PS4 One. Um, and I started playing with that. Um, but I prefer playing shoot 'em up games with with mouse and keyboard. Um, over on the right hand side, I have this skull, which is basically just 
a very fancy pick holder, so it's got a bunch of picks in there. It means that they don't go everywhere all over my desk. This was a very good find in home sense, 12 pounds. It's a very cool, very detailed skull. So yeah, that was just good. Bought it as an ornament, basically. Um, so let's move to the right hand side of the desk. I have um, my headphones here, which I always have, which are the HD 600s. Again, I've fixed them with the Sonyworks reference plugin and they sound even better than they did before. So thank you very much to Sonyworks. So if we start at the top, let's go from the top. So I have a Korg DTR 2000 tuner, to be honest. Barely ever use this thing, but um, it's a very, very good tuner. I tend to use this more um, when I'm setting up my guitar. I don't know why I don't plug into it more. I think it's because I've got a serious lack of guitar cables since setting up all the amps to work through the amp heat. Um, so yeah, that's a DTR tune. I've got then a, a space, which I filled in with like a, I don't know what even you call this. It's like, it's almost like the fur off a bow, <laughs> horsehair, um, just like a blagging panel. So I can put um, my cables to the front of my Zoom UAC-8. The Zoom UAC-8 is a, is a fantastic sound card. Um, it uses the same chipset as the RME Fireface and RME's products are just so stable that I wanted to give it a try and the zoom is stupidly stable. The drivers are really, really good. Uh, the sound's good as well. My preamps have a quite, um, not too warm, but a warm character. Um, nothing like uh, a Neve or anything like that, but it's, I mean, it's, it has character. It's not just stare up. So that was kind of um, a welcome surprise. Um, but yeah, the Zoom UAC has been great. I have one here at my studio and we also have one for the live monument set. So there's one in the rack for the playback tracks and stuff like that. Um, down below I have the uh, old Monuments Focus Strike sound card that we used for years. And this is just connecting some extra stuff into my studio through ADAT, through the UAC8. So I have um, a couple of the things in the guitar rack over here plugged into here through ADAT. It means that, you know, I can have everything connected and I don't have to worry about swapping cables over and stuff like that. So, yeah. Anyway, next down I have uh, the Stam 1073 MPA preamps, um, two of them. I use these a lot, they sound fantastic. Very, very close to a 1073 for a fraction of the cost. So if you're like me and you have a, I guess a, you know, it's a home studio, but it's a project studio, then something like this would be really, really good for you. And below that I have another Stam audio product, which is, the SA4000, which is based off a SSLG comp, so the press you get on the G-Series desk. Uh, again, I use this pretty much on every mastering chain that I do. It's got a fantastic quality to the way that it squashes things. Um, it just gives it this like polish that almost say it sounds like it's gone through lots more gear than just you know plugins in your computer. It just kind of finishes it off with that nice touch. I actually have another stamp um, piece of audio gear just above here. It's the SA12. Uh, just based off the API 512. Um, but uh, for some reason it's been broken ever since I got it. Um, I've tried having it fixed. And they say it's fixed, but it's still not working. I can't really work out what's going on. So that's just kind of an ornament piece right now for my, uh, for my ornament that I got when I played in India. Um, yeah. As far as monitoring goes, I've got the NS10s, which I've already said, which has been powered by the power amp on the other side. I also have the Adam A77Xs, which are fantastic. Again, I, I absolutely love these speakers. They are completely detailed in every single aspect of the frequency spectrum. Um, I tend to just um, go to them secondary just because they seem more of a, mid, uh, a middle monitor um, rather than a near field, you know, mid, mid, uh, midfield monitor. Um, but they sound fantastic, um, no faults at all. Um, I actually mixed technically the first album Gnosis on a set of Adam A7s that belong to our old drummer Mike. And ever since then I've wanted the original A7s but obviously they don't make them anymore. And these are very, very good. I definitely prefer the Adam A77Xs to the A7Xs, but the A7s were amazing. I hope that one day they'll reintroduce that speaker. I had something very, very good about it, especially for the price point. It was just fantastic. So let's move over to the guitar rack, which is monumentally big. <laughs> Let's just move some of this stuff out of the way. I'm a messy puppy, there's just things everywhere. I can never find any places for them. <clears throat> so at the top we have a Samson Powerstrip PS10. It's just basically a glorified 
um, extension lead. Next up we have the Lion 6 Helix, which I use a lot. Um, this particular unit I take in and out of the studio, I have another one, um, but I kind of just want to use one and then if it breaks then I'll use the other one, so that's just downstairs at the moment. Um, I have the Line 6 Pod XT Pro, which I've had for years. Actually, it's coming up to 12 years now I've had this unit. They only broke down once, and it was just because a cable came unplugged on a flight. Um, solid unit, best clean sound ever. Um, and it was used on the first two Monuments records entirely, and, and it even made an appearance on Phrenesis. It's a really great sounding, great sounding unit. No other unit can make a clean sound like that. Next down I have the Two Notes Torpedo uh, Studio, which is a very, very good unit. I actually need to delve more into this unit because there's hundreds of thousands of IRs, and I just never know where to start. Because <laughs> it's, just, it's just like a black hole. Like I actually started using IRs in the early 2000s, so what I would do is I'd plug the effects loop of, effects loop of my angle into my sound card, and then run it through amplitude so that I could get the, the um, cab simulation from it. And I did this very, very early on, and it was just a black hole then, and it's even more of a black hole now, so I need to delve into it. So if you have any ideas for IRs that I can check out, please post them in the, in the uh, comments below. Below that, I have the Mesa Boogie Rectifier Recording Preamp, and I've wanted one of these ever since I was about 17 years old. Um, Akko Kaney had one of these with a 290, and it was just such a humongous sound. And I tried it again, um, about two years ago, through the 290, it was just like, imagine a dual rectifier with more, with more, basically. There's no other way to put it, it's just a really amazing sounding preamp, and then powered with the 290, it's just like magic. And below that I have the Mesa Boogie TC50 rack mount, um, which is a really, really, really good amp as well, I tend to find myself plugging into this a lot. Um, it's a lot less aggressive than the rectifier. It's more. It's somewhere halfway between a Mark series and a rectifier, um, but a very, very good amp. I mean, there's quite a lot of artists playing it now. Nick Johnston plays one. Um, I know the guys from Land of God have been playing this as well. Great sound amp. And then if we go down to the drawer, I just have a bunch of microphones in here. I've got F7, uh, some condensers, some ribbons, a couple of dynamics. Um, most of it's from SE Electronics. They make great microphones. Um, Pretty much all of the demos you would have heard would have been either an SM57 or the SE Electronics microphones. Uh, the ribbon mic, all the dynamic, all the condenser, used them all. So, Right, let's move to guitar amp world. So we'll go from the top. I have a Hughes & Kettner Grandmeister Deluxe 40. Um, very sounding amp. Used this for a recent project with Ollie and his mate Murray. Clean sound is phenomenal and it does this breakup thing, you know, that that when it's almost clean but not quite clean but not quite distorted either, it does that very, very well, that kind of sound. Um, just below this I have the Synergy um, Amps uh, SYN2 and it's a modular system. I have six modules, um, which I'm going to do a video of very soon. You've already probably seen one of the videos that I did with the Soldano module, which was a play through the watch. Um, but there's a Soldano module, a diesel VH4 module, um, a Morgan AC module, um, or the uh, T Deluxe module, which is Fender Deluxe module, it sounds amazing, and a HB and a B Freedom modules. Um, so you're going to get that very, very soon, and that coupled with the SYN50 power amp sounds phenomenal. It's a really, really good uh, thing. It's based off the um, module system that Randall did in the early 2000s. Uh, Egnator also did one. I think it was actually. Um, made by Ignator and it never really caught on and I'm not really too sure why because the RM100 head um, had some amazing sounding units especially if you got it modified by uh, Salvation Audio I think it was the guy from the Czech Republic who now builds the KHKD pedals. Um, next to it I have a couple of DI boxes and a reamp box so I've got the Radial J48, um, the Klotz DI boxes that I just got sent which I need to do a video on as well and also the radial reamper, um, the yellow one. Let's pull that out. The X amp. So yeah, J48 Di X amp. Can't go really wrong with those two things. I tend to avoid using Di's, as many of you guys know. And the reason for that is I just don't really like the sound of reamping too much. Um, I prefer just to get the sound there and then and commit. Because you just play to the amp, 
know what I mean? Anyway, so um, next up we have the Hughes & Kettler Triamp Mark III. This is one of the best amps I've ever heard, hands down. And we used it on the last tour. I'm looking forward to using it on all future tours. But for now I've got six channels of brutality right there. Sounds fucking awesome. Look at it. It looks cool as fuck, doesn't it? Blue. And you can change the color of the LEDs. I don't know if you guys saw, but I was different channel, different LED color. It just looks sick. Okay, next up we have the Ampi One Amplifier. This thing is also phenomenal. Um, it does everything from like a really sparkly clean or really fat clean as well, all the way to disgusting metal. Um, this amp came a very, very close second to being the main rhythm sound of the latest Monuments album. Um, but it was a little bit drier um, than what perhaps we wanted at the time for the sound. Uh, but it did make an appearance for all the lead sounds. All the lead sounds you hear on the record of the Ampi. And then at the bottom is the Laney VH100R, which also made an appearance on the Monuments album, and it's all of the clean sounds in the song of Mirror Image. Um, a very, very good sounding amplifier, uh, most famously used probably by Andy Timmons, I would say, um, back in the day, you know, uh, the Cry For You era. Um, it's got a very, very cool, very, very cool sound. It basically sounds like a um, more gain JCM800, maybe a little bit fatter as well. Um, but yeah, that's amp world. So I have all this connected to the Ampi. So one, two, three, four, with the TC50 is number five. So five amps. And then I have some cabs and stuff over here that I can plug them into. Next over here, we have um, my organizational spot, I guess, with pedals on the top. So I tend to have pedals here that are just new, new ones that I've got, the ones that I use regularly. So this changes quite a lot. Um, it's quite a lot of pedals downstairs in my spare room. Um, recently obviously just saw the video I did for the, the Rev G3. I've got a couple of angle pedals here that I'm going to be doing videos of as well as sending the one to the winner of the competition that I just did. Congratulations Octavian. Uh, I've got the Boss Metal Zone pedal here and serial number 34 of the new Wazacraft. Really wish it was number 33. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, we all know why, don't we? Um, yeah, so that's that part. Next up, we have my guitars in the corner. Not all of them are here. Um, I tend to only have six up here because obviously I've got no other space to put it. So I have my PRS um, SE Custom, which has, it's a semi hollow body with P90, so it's a completely different guitar to anything else that I have. But it's all of the clean sounds on the Emanuensis. Um, they made an appearance with some of the clean sounds on Phonesis as well, um, but I picked that up from um, I made for 50 quid and it's the best 50 quid I've ever spent I think. I have my Minez 7 string baritone uh, Q series in Winter Heather. I've got prototype number one of the Catsy. I have my 8 string Regis, um, a 6 string um, Debel Q series in Springbrook as well as a 5 string Fan Fret Patriot. Uh, most of it's Minez guitars. I have, actually have two of my Mayonnaise currently in, um, sent back to Mayonnaise. There was just a couple of issues I had, so I had one needed a new nut, um, for example. But I've had it for a very long time, so I understand. And I was changing strings, different fantasies, um, and yeah, just needed a new nut because one of the strings just kept moving a little bit. Um, easy fix, you know what I mean? We move over a little bit more, we have the Box of Doom. Um, you guys obviously know what this is. This is an isolation cabinet um, that I can use for guitar or bass. I have a big space here with a rocking chair and a chair in it that I waiting to get a new sofa. I haven't managed to find the sofa I want. I really want a Chesterfield, but it's so fucking expensive. Um, and considering that I'm probably never going to sit on it, spending that much money on a sofa just seems like a waste of money right now. <laughs> And then in this far corner, it's kind of like a junk corner, um, just because I've got nowhere to put it at the moment, but I have Mason 3D 4x12 cab in there, the Hughes and Kent, the 2x12, my Scott Dixon case, a couple of stands and a couple of panels that I haven't put up yet. Um, so yeah, that's the room. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the acoustic uh, treatment on the walls. So we get asked a lot of questions in regards to these acoustic panels. So this is one of the small ones that I made that I still haven't hung up, but I just want to kind of go over the construction of it a little bit so you guys can understand what I did. So 
This one's 600 millimeters by 600 millimeters or 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters. Sorry Americans, I don't know what that is in inches. I guess it would be what, 15 centimeters is six inches, 12, 24 by 24, is that right? Yeah, so 24 inches by 24 inches. Um, thickness, I can't remember. Um, so it's just four pieces of pine that I screwed together. Feel the screws here actually, badly. Could probably do a better job now. <laughs> Um, and then on the inside, I um, used like little hooks. Uh, what this? The, the the ring hooks. So basically, nothing came out. Circular hooks. Screwed them into the sides and created a crisscross pattern of um, string, quite thick string. Um, placed a sheet of rock wool. I think you guys have it as north in the states or something else, um, which is basically just. Um, insulation um, for you know things that get in your attic and stuff like that and then um, and then I've also uh, and then put that in and then I've wrapped it in a fabric so this fabric isn't this isn't how it came from the shop this was originally white a medium density calico and I put it in the washing machine um, with a dye um, red rose I think it was called um, and I kind of put it through once or twice, I can't remember how many times, and then these patterns started appearing. I really liked the kind of tie-dye-ish kind of effect that it created, so I didn't even finish off the dye. And I, I actually did the same thing for my black panels as well, but it's obviously a little bit less noticeable. When you get up close, you can see that it's actually different um, shades of black, and it just looks really cool. Um, so they're very, very easy to make. I mean, for all of the panels in this room, I spent about 150 English pounds. Um, and if I was to buy as many panels as I've made in this room, it would have cost me well over, you know, well over 800 quid uh, for something, say, like gig acoustics or something like that. So it was all, all in all, it was a good project. I mean, it was very stressful <laughs> uh, just because I'm not particularly great with, um, well, I say I'm not particularly great with woodwork, but I just have the correct tools to um, do the good finish, basically. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to do this properly, you need a mitre. Um, Cut an angle on all corners, make it all look all flush. And then staple gun, screwdriver, electric screwdriver, and, and a couple of other things, and you'll be good to go. Um, but a lot of people ask me about these. So then, um, obviously, I've got my yin yang one on the wall. That was just some fabric that I bought from a shop um, about six years ago. It was like a drape. Um, you can find loads of cool drapes on the internet or in shops, especially if you go to like those smoke shops or the hippie shops you can find loads of cool stuff like that um, so yeah that's the acoustic isolation for my room I hope you've enjoyed my studio tour I'll see you in the next video and have a very good 2019